Everyone has a talent. Something they are better at than almost anyone else. Raw talent without work gets you nowhere. But if you commit, you can become exceptional. You can make an impact. Estonia, the digital hub of Northern Europe. Good morning and welcome to day four of our virtual trade mission to Estonia. We think Estonia is the most advanced digital society and it is also the gateway to the Nordics and the Baltics. Now, this is day four. As I said, on our first morning, we were introducing generally the Estonian ITC community, talking about business in Estonia. And we also introduced the uh, very revolutionary e-residency program by the Estonian government. And that is really the key and the secret to allowing you to do business and make investments in Estonia. On day two, we were looking at food and food tech. And yesterday, we were looking at the health tech and biotech industries. I know it's morning for you, but we are coming live from the evening because we're here in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. My name is Louis Zezeran. I'm happy to be your host here this morning for you. As you can tell from my accent, I am not Estonian. I am Australian. Fair dinkum, bonza, Australian, put a shrimp on the barbie. Uh, however, I have lived in Estonia for over 12 years now. I'm an entrepreneur. I run a small production company here. And so i am be able to give some very particular insights into what it's like to come as a foreigner to Estonia, how it is to do business. And I'm also going to be sharing those insights with you today. Now, all of the information that we have in this morning's session, the different companies that you're going to hear from, uh, we have representatives from those companies available in the Interrupt Me web page that you're viewing right now. On this web page, you can make the contacts, you can ask the questions, you can even hook up one-on-ones, even video calls using this application. And this is the place to ask questions, Representatives from the companies, representatives from work in Estonia, trade Estonia, are going to be here to tell you about it. So this is where you should be asking your questions. Now, today's morning session is about IoT, electronics, and manufacturing. Now, to kick us off and to give us an introduction to what it's like doing business in Estonia, I'd like to welcome to the couches here James York, who's from Trade Estonia. Good nice, morning. Nice, nice to see to you be again. Back. Yeah. So this is day four. This is day four. What a what a week it's been. It has, wow. and there's so many different sectors. The Estonian uh, business community is so active that you know we really needed these four sessions to yes. go through everything. Yes, we did. Okay. Now, first of all, James, you're also a foreigner. I, can I, I this. am. I'm a native New Yorker. Okay. Um, yep. But at this point kind of, let's say, adopted Estonian. So I'm as Estonian as you can be without technically being Estonian. Okay, I understand that one. But, okay. uh, yeah. and What's I, your job? So I work uh, out of the Consulate General in New York uh, for Enterprise Estonia. I'm the Director of U.S. Business and Innovation. Mm -hmm. um, so my role is really to help uh, facilitate more trade and investment between Estonia and the U.S., helping Estonian companies looking at uh, how to get market access into the U.S., finding partners, um, getting information about the market, helping uh, U.S. companies looking to uh, find investment opportunities in Estonia or maybe site selection for an FDI play um, and really just trying to help facilitate business in both directions. Right. Okay. So a bit of a bit of a two-way street yes, is your work there between the two countries. So, I mean, it's your job, but tell us about <laughs> what is, what do you think is making Estonia stand out? Lots of stuff. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Estonia is, uh, is not on a lot of people's radar, but it really is an absolutely amazing place. Mm. Um, it's earned a reputation as, you know, the world's leading digital society. Yes, it um, it's very well known for its uh, amazingly robust and tightly knit startup community. Um, 
And uh, you know, while it's, Estonia has kind of earned this reputation as this kind of gleaming unicorn on the hill, um, and I, I've mentioned this the other days, um, <laughs> <laughs> attached to this uh, particular horse with a horn, there's a cart. And in this cart, there's lots of really other interesting things. Um, and we're going to look at a lot of them today. And uh, I'm really, really excited about it. Yeah, it's it's sort of Estonia is known somewhat for its startup community, mm -hmm. and this uh, it's almost like a countrywide incubator yes. for developing this talent. But along with that is many different sectors. It's not limited to just one. Exactly. Sector, is so it? you know we're talking everything from IT service providers, like you saw on the first day, um, and uh, and startups, of course. Uh, really amazing, high quality food products from mm. one of the most pristine natural environments left in the world. Um, you've got health tech and biotech, like the the, uh, the biobank that was just speaking yesterday, um, and uh, you've got some really interesting things like uh, robots. <laughs> That's <laughs> that what we're, we're going to be looking at today. today. What I wanted to do though was unpack a little bit about when we refer to oh, Estonia is the most digital society, <laughs> and it sounds like something that a government agency would come up with as a very slick no, marketing campaign. No, <laughs> but let's <laughs> let's unpack that a little bit. So. Here in Estonia, every citizen and indeed every resident gets an ID card. And that ID card has a SIM chip in it mm -hmm. that you are able to stick into your computer. And that will securely authenticate you with the government websites and government systems. Yes. So, so about 99% of governmental services are actually available online mm. 24 hours a day. Um, so the entire country is built on this digital infrastructure, um, which is... It's extremely robust and secure, um, but what's what's really interesting, especially for the American audience, uh, is that about five years ago, they started uh, something called the e-residency mm. program, and this allows you to tap into the the digital infrastructure that exists here and interact with uh, with the government and different private sector companies, uh, so that you can actually start, run, and and grow a business here entirely remotely, which is amazing. It's a super interesting system. It kind of was coming about because, yeah, Estonia had developed this completely online solution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost, you know, 25 years ago, they almost had a green field to re-implement yes. a whole country. If you're asking yes. where, how did Estonia get so digital? Well, mm -hmm. they got nothing. They decide to just do it <laughs> well and do it from scratch. Yes. And we interact with the government almost completely online. I mm -hmm. myself, I've only had to interact with the government twice, directly in person, twice in five years, uh, in the last five years. One was I got the driver's license, so I had to go to the Estonian DMV to do the test. Uh, and the second was the only other time was I had to go to the office to pick up my new ID card. That's it. Yes. And after implementing those services for the Estonian population, the government thought, well, how can we also offer them to foreign nationals to encourage them to work and invest in Estonia. Exactly. And it's, it's honestly, it's a really compelling business environment because not a lot of people are aware, but Estonia actually has a 0% corporate tax rate on reinvested profits, mm. which means that uh, if the money is staying on the company account, you're not paying tax on it, which yeah. means that you can use it for growth, you can use it for more investment. Um, and this is kind of the attitude that the Estonian government has taken overall, is let's really look at how we can make our business environment good for business. And this is just one more thing that they're doing to help facilitate that. So it's really, really an amazing environment to operate in. Yeah, that uh, simple tax system is something definitely I appreciate as an entrepreneur myself. As, as you were saying, if you don't take the money out, you basically pay the tax when you take the money out of the company. Exactly. Maybe salaries or dividends or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and it's not a tax haven. I mean, the Estonian government, they want their cut. Don't yes. worry. Uh, but it's, it's if you leave it in there and you don't use it. And about a year ago, I was in Atlanta. A school friend of mine from Australia runs a catering company mm -hmm. there, runs multiple kitchens, very successful operation. And I mean, it took him a good hour to explain his tax system to me and how he has to do it. And I was like, bro, 20% on uh, dividends. We good. And yeah. he's like, what? That's it? And yeah. I'm like... Uh, and, and sort of the complexities and indeed the, uh, I don't know, this is a rule, this is an exception, and this is a waiver, and mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I'm a simple guy, I don't want to have uh, to do Well, that, let's so. say in the, in the US on my personal return, it's a fairly straightforward process, um, but I, I recently got a 100-page PDF from my accountant, <laughs> versus here, um, where it used to be a really painful five minutes, it's now down to a really efficient three. 
to right. file your taxes because everything is interconnected, everything is synced up, and basically all you have to go through is uh, go through the portal, confirm that all the information is correct, and then push the button and you're done. And it's yeah. amazing. Yes, uh, yeah, the, the information is pre-filled out mm -hmm. on the tax return. I guess that's the, the most important thing for me. I mean, the, yeah. I go to the bank, I log into the bank, the bank reminded me to fill in my tax return. Isn't that friendly? Yeah, I'm yes. like, cool, okay, I click, <laughs> oh, very good, I'm gonna click through, oh. Uh, oh, I, I think. <laughs> exactly. But <laughs> yes. I mean, for, you know, for, so I think that's really, you know, a really good example of the kind of transparency that you'll find in the business environment here. Mm. And that really does bleed through um, in every facet of Estonian culture and life. Um, Estonians themselves are very straightforward. Um, they run their businesses in a really transparent way. Um, if they say they're going to do something, you can bet that it's going to happen. <laughs> um, and, you know, this, the, the, let's say, at least on the, the tech community side, the, the current uh, ecosystem, it's built by the people who built Skype. Mm. So you're, you're really getting some of the globally best talent in one really small community where there's maybe one degree of separation, which means that you can do really amazing things and create really amazing things. And for US companies looking for partners, it means that you can kind of come with, a, you know, let's say maybe a half-baked idea and uh, put it on the table of, of an Estonian partner and they'll figure out how to make it happen, which is amazing. It is an amazing thing because we're a tight community. And how do we get to a tight knit community? Because the population is 1.3 million yes. people. I know that's a city, that's a suburb <laughs> for many of you. I mean, 1.3 million people get borders and a president used to have their own money, they get their own bank. It, it seems a bit nuts at first, but it's something that works and it means that the community is close knit and we're used to, I mean, I, if I go down to the supermarket, I might see a government minister, maybe the nicer <laughs> supermarket, but you know, it's not weird, meaning that yeah. there's no levels of, of separation here. So when, as you said, when the Skype guys had that great success, when they made the first sale, mm -hmm. uh, they were able to not only reinvest the money back into the startup community and the economy here, but the knowledge yeah. that it was very easy for them to transfer that. And we're seeing second generation, third, fourth generation yeah. startups that you can all trace back to that Skype. Hmm. 100%. Indeed. All right, James, we do need to move on with the morning. Thank Super. you very much for your time, sir. <sighs> Thank you. It's good to see you again. See you soon. Okay, so today's, to, this morning's session today is all about IoT. We're looking at electronics and we're looking at manufacturing companies. Now to give us a bit of an overview of this industry in Estonia and where the market is at right now, uh, I'd like to welcome up here to the couch and have a talk with the CEO of Prototron, uh, Ms. Jana Budkoskaya. Welcome, Jana. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> Jana, it's nice to see you again. Same words. If you've, look, if you've been watching a couple of these sessions over the last few days, you know we all know each other. It's a close-knit <laughs> community. We've all exactly. worked together over the years, so yeah. you know, everyone is, is familiar. Now, you're the CEO of Prototron. First of all, what, what is Prototron? So, Prototron, I, I really love to introduce it because it's really very easy. We run a competition and we try to tackle, to, to find the best potential talents and to give them money for them to try out their ideas. So we give money for them to prototype the tech ideas. Right, so this is even before startup phase. This, this is, is idea to absolutely. something stage. Yes, so very often the teams who are coming to us, they're just uh, friends and dream, and uh, we are really very happy to help them and to give this first push. I admire what you do. I, I mean, <laughs> we've worked together a bunch. I've been at a bunch of your events over the years, and I love that like, there's the, the, you can see the ideas that are good, and you go, okay, that's solid. And then you see the ideas that are crazy and you go like, that's crazy. That's, <laughs> what the hell are these kids thinking? But there's the few of them that I've noticed over the years where I go, oh, them kids, they crazy. But then three years later, I'm like, oh, dang. Yes, they exactly. They made something of that. And this is, for me, this is also sometimes something, you know, uh, because of the decision when it's so much of uncertainty and we know each other, then it means that... Uh, how our investors, so I really don't want to be on the place of our investors who decide. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I really think that a lot, of, a lot of the guys who are coming to the finals, that they are really deserve to get this money. But then sometimes there is something happen and some team will get money and some team will not. But then I'm really, I'm absolutely excited about our program because 
a lot of the teams from already from the finals, even the, if they haven't got the money, they are skyrocketing further. Mm -hmm. For example, Fractory, which I know will be soon, they have been twice in Prodotron and something happened. <laughs> okay. But you see how they have done. So I'm absolutely happy with them. That's a, it's a nice story that, I mean, it's common in many startup communities all around the world that, okay, there's pitching competitions in these competitions. Yeah. And look, you know, that is important, but it's not all about winning that in competition. It's like, okay, we have the sense to view you and work out. Okay, yeah. we'll just give you a bit more help and help you out and see how you go. And, yep. you know, it's not so cutthroat in that way. Like, okay. So tell us about the uh, electronics sector in Estonia, because it just seems to be quite amazing right now. Yes, I suppose that our electronic sector is uh, very niche. Uh, we have some very certain and, but very, very strong uh, um, sectors. I just uh, looked uh, for the statistics, so we have more than 250 companies who are working in the electronic sector and IoT and mechatronic, and uh, which I'm very happy that we are slow. We were very, very strong in engineering. Mm. So we have a very strong tradition for automotive, automatics and we have a very good about the electronic systems and all the energy sector, what we have very huge uh, mm. here in Estonia. Um, and now we are moving very fastly from uh, so-called like subcontractors sub from the big companies like Ericsson and ABB and everything what we have here, but we are moving to the R&D. So our solutions, our development, and it's going viral. So um, I'm really very optimistic about our sector. And what I see, we are very fast to catch up with the, all the global trends about the IoT, about 5G. So for example, a lot of 5G um, components, which are now used in US, for example, mm are produced here in Estonia. Mm. So, okay, in logistics, they have a very long story how they go <laughs> to US, as it always, but still, we have here. Or, for example, you know, the safety belts. Mm -hmm. uh, all the Tesla Model 3, they use the safety belts, which is produced in Estonia. Uh -huh, okay. So, we are, <laughs> we are very well connected with this, uh, all this defensive stuff, I would say, in the electronics. Right, and you're right, it did come from a, an engineering focus, I guess, at first. We've talked yep. a bit about, in the previous days already, about the software and so forth that through Skype, mm -hmm. Estonia was already kind of well known yep. for. But this, uh, I mean, we got a lot of electronics hackers who, with institutions like yourselves, have been able to take that into, into something more. Yes, exactly. And again, you will soon have uh, Cleveron, which mm. is, I suppose, really amazing because... I have heard that they are trying, like, even not from them, but from another, from the teams who are coming to Prototron, that there is a community like the hardware and electronic mafia around the Cleveron. Yeah. And I think it's very, really, really very cool that um, we have this, those guys who are really understand what, what the electronics means. <laughs> there is. The, it's a close-knit community here, as I was saying. Um, there is a feeling like we want to help. Yep. one other like it's okay i mean sure hey look we're all trying to do the business you know we're all trying to get ahead in business absolutely we're not all like skipping and dancing through the fields we're not trying to say that but overall there is a mm -hmm. community of we're going to help each other we're going to try and get there and yep. a common thread that i've heard already over the last few days is that in, in estonia the market isn't there there is I mean, there's no market. There's no, okay, there's let's no be fair. market. <laughs> no. So you have to look global, and indeed, you can use it as an R and D base, mm -hmm. as you said. Use this pool of talent. Maybe uh, international companies, American companies, want to use uh, Estonia as a base. Get set up. Use the uh, government infrastructure. It's easy to mm -hmm. set up a subsidiary. It's easy to get that rolling. It's easy to employ uh, skilled engineers get that stuff straight and then if you want to take it out to the european market it's a great base for that or Absolutely. if you want to get those electronics and then uh, mm -hmm. export it elsewhere so yeah and uh, as you mentioned these uh, talents and engineers uh, which i'm also very happy that it was always been there in estonia that uh, our universities were very strong in engineering mm. and for example one of the um, the first electronic electric car which were produced on the base of uh, pabeda 9 1956, if I'm not mistaken, with the year number, but it was produced in Tallinn Technical University. And you know, this is the big competition with electric cars in uh, Australia. 
Sure. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. and our then get across the, the outback. Yeah, and the, our car was the winner of it. And mm. now the the new big dream of our Estonian like, students and talents is to produce the solar panel uh, electric car and to go again to Australia okay. and win this race. <laughs> right, because that's the one they go across the outback and they just go as far as they can. Like the cars just stop when uh, yeah, they get I, If I'm not mistaken, there are some kind of... Um, uh, amount of thousands but still mm. so this is which I also think very important that and now I see that it's not only the university based products or like pro project but the um, all the startup society is also involved and mm. the big factories and big electronic factories and I know that this uh, project Solarite they are working closely with electronic uh, sector because they help them to build it up mm. so this is also what what is really important that we have this very good pipeline of the talents. Mm. Right. There's a lot of cross-pollination between all these companies. Mm -hmm. The pipeline has come along very well. Uh, and I think going on from what you were saying, that Estonia isn't a place for cheap labor and cheap no. engineers. Yes, and fortunately. It, Highly skilled engineers, I would say, is what your organization and Taltech, uh, the Tallinn uh, University of Technology, uh, and such institutions are turning out. That what that means for companies who are looking to Estonia is that it's cheaper than the Nordics. It's not like setting up in Sweden with high regulation mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and the the socialism and all the things that are going on up there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then again, you're still getting, it's not like, oh, outsourcing to very far off countries yes. or something like that. You're getting that very high standard. But I also believe that this is, this is what I believe technology makes and IoT and especially, for example, robotics, which is also is very raising star, so-called here in Estonia. In Prodotron, we have like uh, during the last years, a lot of robotic solutions. Mm. But it's also, I was just talked recently with some companies and they said, uh, cost efficiency. So it means that we can keep our cool guys here. They, we do not need to outsource everything. But it means that if you, you know, as Steve Jobs said, you don't need to work for 12 hours, but you need to work with your brain. So sometimes it means the cost efficiency means that you have highly skilled professional and he do his work best and you don't need to check it and to repair it. Sure. And uh, even with the um, I mean, cost of doing business in general, I think, is pretty low. Like, mm, I mean, it, Estonia is not super cheap. It's not like, oh, we're in the back of some far-flung country and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the lunch costs 20 cents. It's nothing like this, right? It's a proper place. But it's still, again, not as it hasn't got a cost of living like some of the large American cities mm -hmm. or cities in the Nordics that it's still actually pretty cost-effective to yes. hire high-level talent here. And... Not only that, for them to live and for them to appreciate that wage. Yes. You know, that wage maybe isn't as high as, let's say, Sweden or Norway. But then again, the cost of living is so much lower that it kind of works out very well for so, the individuals. Yeah, until now, I hope to <laughs> it will be, still be there. It's getting, I, I think it's still all right. All right, Jana, we've run out of time this mm. morning. So thank you for your introduction to this You're sector welcome. in Estonia. And we're going to hear some of these companies now. Yes. All right. Have a good morning. Thanks. All right, so we're talking about IoT manufacturing, we're talking about electronics today, and we're trying to highlight some of the companies that are working in this physical electronics sector. And one of the most notable we are uh, about to hear from today. So our first company that we're gonna hear from is Fractory, and they are tackling problems in the manufacturing industry. Some of these problems that have been around for over 30 years, they are really getting to the core of the industry. So to tell us all about it, we have the CEO and co-founder of Fractory, Mr. Martin Bares. Hi everyone, uh, it's really nice to be here and uh, thank you Enterprise Estonia for putting this together. It looks really, really cool and, uh, and uh, hopefully everyone has had a great day already and the previous days. My name is Martin and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fractory. Fractory is an automated on-demand manufacturing platform connecting engineering and manufacturing companies what it means. So 
A bit of a background about me. I'm a mechanical engineer, actually, and I started working as one uh, when I was 21. And uh, I spent roughly five years working as a mechanical engineer in different, uh, different companies. And uh, one problem that really struck out for me, because it, I used to spend so much time on it, was outsourcing. So mechanical engineers, they go through five years in, uh, in school, they're highly educated, they're smart, and uh, then they're put into workplace, and uh, depending on a, on, a, on a job, but they spend 20%, 40%, 60% of their time on emails and phone calls. That's just, that's just stupid. And where this problem comes from? So there are, uh, most of the companies in manufacturing industry are SMEs. And uh, while they are making their own products, they don't have all the necessary equipment uh, to make all the parts. And then there are manufacturing companies who provide a specific manufacturing process as a service. Now, those companies trade between each other. But uh, the process of getting a quote for a custom manufacturing order can take days. You, as an engineer, you send out five to ten emails to different suppliers asking for a quote and the lead time. And uh, if you're lucky, the next day one of them will have replied to you, five of them will never reply to you. You spend a week getting all of this together, trying to make the best decision. And at the same time, those five who do reply to you, only one of them wins the job. So that means that the rest four have done a meaningless job. So we at Factory, we changed that. We made a system where the same engineering drawings can be uploaded, and the system automatically calculates the market price, lead time, and transportation cost for this specific order. So how this all works? We have a network of manufacturing uh, partners. They're connected to the platform. They are pre-vetted. We check them. We establish uh, quality guidelines, packaging guidelines, and so on. All of their information is inside our platform, and it uses this information plus the historic data of the market to come up with the price with your custom one-off part. And you can uh, upload only one or up to hundreds. And uh, the process for the engineer is really simple. Uploads the parts. Uh, as you can see, there are two of them up here already. They can uh, change the price, uh, sorry, change the material, change the quantities, uh, add some notes. And the, the price keeps constantly changing on the right side. And when everything is finished, they check out like in uh, any other e-commerce site, Amazon, similar. Uh, after that, the... Um, the supply chain takes over. Uh, the system directs the job directly to a most suitable manufacturing company. Uh, they will perform the job. They come back to the platform, click a button, and our system automatically uh, orders the transportation for this order to send it back to the customer. So basically what it means, customer only has to visit the site once to fulfill the order that used to take a lot of time, and the supplier twice First, accept, accepting the job, second one, marking it done. Now, let's look, take a look at the math. I know it's not interesting uh, as much uh, when, you, when you look at the numbers, but bear with me, it's really, really important. The old solution used to take three hours on both sides for an average order, which is around 1,000 euros. And if you calculate all of this together, that's administrative jo uh, work of roughly 400 euros. At Fractory, it takes both sides maximum 15 minutes and a fraction of a cost. Now, to go a bit more specifically what we are doing, manufacturing is a huge market, so we are, we are tackling one sector of it, which is sheet metal. Sheet metal parts can be something as simple as a piece of furniture to something as big as, um, something as, big as ships. Actually, now that I know who is speaking after me, both of them are our clients as well, Cleveron and Mildrem. Uh, sheet metal market in North America and Europe totals at about 50 billion a year. 
and the global market roughly six times even bigger. And we make money, of course, as well, uh, and we do it by, by putting a markup on each order. Uh, we see it as fair uh, for the customers and the suppliers, because what our system does is still being able to deliver a market competitive price, but through this optimization, uh, we find, uh, find the most suitable supplier, and that leaves a bit of a percentage for us as well. Again, this wall of text here is on purpose. Don't read it, uh, but it's there and you know it. Uh, why we're doing this, what gives us the strength to tackle such a big problem? Apparently, there has been a lot of scientific research uh, done in this um, topic over the years. There are roughly 100 researchers around the world studying cloud manufacturing as a paradigm, and it's all of their conclusions uh, result in um, that cloud manufacturing will be the biggest efficiency booster in the manufacturing industry ever. Not steam engines, not assembly lines, not robotics, cloud manufacturing. So who are our customers? As I said, most of them are SMEs, but just for the sake of familiarity, I put some uh, bigger names on here. They are also our customers. But we still get 40% of one-time customers. These are uh, hobby builders, uh, startups, uh, designers, students who only need this service once. Now, before Fractory or a similar service, they never get the chance because a traditional industry just would have too much of an admi administrative overhead to take their orders. We made it possible. But the bulk and the large amount of our revenue actually comes from those repeat customers, and our most active customers are already reaching close to 100 orders by one company. Um, we started in 2018. That was our first year. In January, we launched our product. It was an absolute nightmare product. It was bad. Uh, but we did it to get, gain feedback, to get started, to get the first customers, to get the feedback, and start building what we actually want to build. Now we are in... Uh, markets like Baltics, Nordics, and UK, and a bit of US as well, more about that later. We, in 2019, we grew roughly 5x in all key metrics. We started 2020 uh, with the same goals in mind, but COVID hitting it, we had to reiterate that. But we've already done twice the revenue we did last year. Now, we have been recognized. We didn't get much in the beginning, as Jana mentioned previously. We entered Prototron uh, twice and similar events, got turned down. Everybody thought that our uh, what we want to build is just uh, too out there, too crazy, uh, not going to be happening. Uh, but we did go out there. We did start building, and we found first believers in the eyes of uh, startup Wise Guys, which is an amazing accelerator here in Estonia. Uh, as we have been growing, they have been growing as well. Uh, great companies coming out of there, so anybody interesting, keep an eye on that. And uh, uh, we now have, I would say, the best and the more, most active VCs in the region backing us as well, as well as many awards here uh, and in the rest of the European countries. Now, although what we're doing is, uh, is in many ways pioneering and uh, in many ways we're doing it for the first time and we don't have anybody to copy or anybody to learn from much, uh, but we still have competitors. And for some reason, most of them are coming from either Germany or US. The biggest competitor is actually a US company called Xometry. They just raised their Series E. In total, they raised 200 million. So they've had roughly 100 times more resources than we have had, but, and it's actually their words, we still have the best technology in the sector. Now our roadmap, we recently closed our breach round to get us to the next year, to get us through these tough times. Although we were still growing throughout COVID, we still needed a bit more help from our investors to reach uh, the goal we have set for ourselves, which is 
100k revenue uh, monthly by spring next year and to raise a Series A. But before that, uh, we want to tackle the North America properly. Now, Fractory is already active in the US. In uh, spring this year, we tried to open it up, but COVID taking its effect, the customers weren't just in the position to make the new decisions and make changes. But we wanna, wanna still uh, tackle it, and for that we actually do need help from the listeners. Uh, we need to establish an entity, find out where it's most suitable, where is the uh, highest number of our potential customers, and uh, how to find a proper leader in, the, in this market for us to lead the subsidiary and roll out marketing and sales. Now, who is behind Fractory besides me? As mentioned, I'm a co-founder, so there's, it means there's somebody else as well. Though somebody else is, is Josep Andrein. Uh, Josep was in software sales before Fractory as well. He's leading the sales team currently in both Estonia and UK. Uh, Rain was, surprise, surprise, a developer at Skype uh, before Fractory and uh, was looking for something to build on his own. In addition to us, there are 14 people in Estonia and eight in UK. While the UK office is mostly or only commercial, um, our Estonian office holds the rest, which is development, marketing, accounting, financials, uh, and the founding team. Now, why we are we in Estonia? As it's been said in the previous days and before me, Estonia is a great place to build a company. The, the administrate, administrative tasks around it are really simplified. But not only that, uh, as mentioned again previously, when an Estonian says they're going to do something, they're going to bloody do it. And, uh, and we can see it from our employees as well and, uh, and from our team. Uh, I would have a really hard time moving our core to somewhere else. Now, while we will still keep the core in Estonia, uh, our aim is global. We aim to cover the global metal manufacturing industry and connect it under a single unified platform. I'm looking really forward to the questions and conversations later on in the chat rooms. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Take a seat over there, my friend. Good talk. Now, you made a comment. Uh, it was like a line in one of the slides. And you said that one of the advantages you had was you've kind of developed a playbook for moving into a new market. And so I guess run us through, because it's, you've got a traditional industry that it's tough to turn around, slow to turn around, and then you're crossing borders, cultures, and so forth. So... Give us a bit of an insight about how you look at a new market and how you go about attacking that. Yeah, well, uh, when you're a young company, don't really have much resources to go into any place you want to go. So uh, why we went into UK as well instead of US, for example. In UK, you can do everything. If, if you're not in the center of London, you can do everything for the same amount of money as in Estonia. Mm. If you go to US, you're probably paying twice uh, as much for everything. So that's why we took UK first. But it was also a good learning for us, and that's where we developed a sort of expansion playbook as well. Uh, about one third of what we did there when we first went there was right, and two thirds was wrong. So learning from those mistakes and putting that one third together and uh, trying to replicate uh, it again in US or other markets is going to be the idea We'll see how it works out. <laughs> okay, so I mean, without giving away the business secrets, what are the right things? I mean, you are making connections with the industry, I guess. Is it a marketing? What are the activities? Yeah, definitely. So one of the things uh, uh, I believe we did right, so uh, places like Enterprise Estonia, they exist in other countries as well, right? So going to them, trying to make them... Uh, make you introductions to relevant industry, players, universities, whatnot. So mm. uh, I'm currently sitting at the advisory board of Manchester Metropolitan University uh, because of the connections like this. I, we have more credibility. So building up that, uh, that network uh, definitely uh, gives you sort of 
the impression that you're, you're part of the local culture, uh, but also gives you a bit bit of an insight. So you're not all alone there. You you have somebody to to ask from. And one other thing we definitely did wrong was we went there and then started to take care of the administrative stuff like. Uh, 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 making the company and, and getting a bank account. So registering the company in UK is quite straightforward as well. It took about two weeks. Now getting a bank account, that took us five months. <laughs> okay, so you should have, you kind of rocked up and went, yeah. br a very Estonian style. <laughs> yeah. Got off the plane and went, bring it on. <laughs> Let's, why aren't I making sales? It's already yeah. the afternoon. And he went, okay, slow down, champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a few more things to do. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so you made the company, you've got the bank account. Uh, if we've done a bit more prep work, so yeah. you've kind of learned about the reconnaissance essentially mm. that you need to make first. Yeah, yeah. Because we... you, you're coming from Estonia, you, you expect all of these things <laughs> to go quite smoothly and fast. And you, although you hear, yeah, it's going to take longer, but you're not expecting five months. You're expecting, okay, it's not going to be one day, it's going to be five days. Especially, I mean, you're a European Union yeah. citizen. You know, you expect there might know, be something right? going on in there. Yeah. Look, I'm the same, my friend. Even though I am a humble, I am a member of the, a citizen of the Commonwealth. <laughs> I am a humble servant of her Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. I don't get any privileges in the United <laughs> Kingdom. So yeah. that's the way borders and that's the way diplomacy works. Um, are you feeling, I mean, do you get pushback from the more traditional elements in your industry or is it more once they see it rolling, it sells itself? How do you feel oh, about that? Definitely. So um, I think, uh, so you can verify my words as well. Uh, one of the partners of Point Nine Capital, a German VC fund, uh, is constantly for years now monitoring the startups in the manufacturing and the industrial sector. And um, uh, he recently published an article in Medium uh, about the situation in the, in, in the sector. And um, he very rightly uh, pointed out there that um, when you're starting a startup, then you have this mentality that uh, once you build it, they will come and mm. everything will start booming, hockey sticks and whatnot. Uh, in manufacturing industry, it's never going to happen. It's, it's a slow industry. And uh, well, in outsourcing, last innovation was email. That's got popular roughly 30 years ago. Yeah. So that's what they're using right now and Excel uh, behind that. So if you're di trying to change, you're changing a status quo that has been there for a very long time and that takes time. Okay, that does sound, that does sound difficult. All right, we've got to wrap it up soon. I mean, everything's on the plate right now. Expansion, traditional market, COVID. What's your <laughs> biggest challenge? Um, well, Finding people uh, currently is pretty difficult. So, for example, our UK office has been uh, in lockdown since March. Oh, okay. uh, and we're trying to double the team there. Uh, finding people remotely and onboarding them, that's, yeah. that's a tough one. Okay, you can't get them into the We office actually have one guy in our office uh, who we uh, signed the documents a month before lockdown. And uh, he has only been in the office for one day. Okay, I mean, that's even a tough leadership problem for you to, yep. how do I motivate this guy? How do I get him on board with what doing? How to, you know, we- Definitely, we but sure. I have a great team around me and I'm not doing it alone, so that helps. Ah, it's all good. All right, Martin, thank you very much for your talk thank today. Thank you. All right, Cheers. see you, champ. Okay, so moving on, we're looking at the, uh, very much about robotics, I would say, in our next section, but our next speaker will explain more. So our next company is Cleveron. We've already mentioned them several times today and over the last three days. Cleveron is creating the world's most innovative robot-based click and delivery parcel robots, and they do count as one of their customers as Walmart in America. So let's hear from the COO of Cleveron, Mr. Mikael Ilp. Hi, everybody. My name is Mikkel and I'm taking care of the day-to-day -day operations in uh, Cleveron. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for this great opportunity to speak here and to introduce our story uh, together with other uh, Estonian companies who have, in a way, made it in the, in the, in the world. First of all, to kick off, I'd like to talk about time. Time is uh, a very precious thing. People have be 
uh, become uh, uh, understanding that more and more uh, these days. It's relatively easy with money. Uh, you can make money, you can lose money, and you can make money again. But if you've uh, uh, spent your time on something that is of low value to you, you've basically lost it. You've spent it. Also, we live in an experience-based economy. In this economy, people vote with their feet. If they like your product or service, they will come back and they will spend their money on your product or service. Why am I talking about these two things? It's uh, because these two things were the uh, Kickstarter for Cleveron. Let me tell you the story. Uh, about 13, uh, 14 years ago, uh, in the uh, early 2000s, the e-commerce um, uh, uh, sector in Estonia was starting up. People were uh, shopping online, they were using platforms like Google and Amazon, or um, uh, Estonian uh, internet stores. That was all good. Where the trouble started was receiving these parcels. You had basically two options there. Either your parcel arrived in a postal office, which most of the time was closed, uh, or uh, you had to wait for the delivery guy at your home. This was time consuming. So all together, the, the uh, user experience of this uh, uh, shopping process was not good and it was time consuming. So Cleveron thought that we can, we can change this. We can make uh, uh, this uh, online shopping really uh, uh, quick and easy. And uh, uh, of course, the parcel pickup process was the bit that, uh, that Cleveron started to uh, tackle. Uh, we had an idea. We thought that, uh, how can we solve this problem? We thought perhaps uh, uh, automated uh, terminals would be the solution. And this brings me uh, to the next slide. That talks all about environment. If you think about it, environment is very, very important. If the environment is right, plants will grow. If the environment is, uh, is good, a good idea shapes into a product or a service that can change the world. Uh, so our, uh, our uh, owners uh, started to develop uh, uh, um, locker systems, locker systems that were easy to um, uh, operate. Um, now, I strongly believe that Estonia is one of the best places in the world where to live. Uh, and of course, where to operate your business. If you ask why, it's because of the people. Estonians are really hardworking, they push, uh, push forward. They are not afraid of, of challenges, of new things. They want to tackle the world. Uh, then we have a very good educational system where uh, uh, people are prepped for the modern businesses, whatever they may be. Is it engineering, IT, or, or something else? Then the levels of bureaucracy are really, really small in Estonia, or low. Uh, and the government supports these, uh, these young companies, these crazy guys who have a, 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 a clever idea. And through that, these ideas form into products again. And um, um, not uh, uh, less important is the fact that Estonia is a tiny country. Some may think that's a bad thing. Uh, on the contrary, I think it's a really good thing because uh, uh, living in such a country where almost everybody knows everybody gives you new opportunities and perspectives. Uh, this is a small market where you can uh, pilot everything quickly. If you don't know it, your friend will know it. You can go and connect with people, talk, and you will find solutions. So all these things together, and basically you can create uh, products that will uh, take off and, and change the world. As you, you uh, probably know, there are 
quite a number of companies who have who have really made it in the wild, wild world, and they have all come from Estonia. Um, on this, uh, this slide, you can see there um, a funny situation in, in Viljandi, where Cleveron's uh, headquarter is located. You can see there uh, a tower. That's our first robotic uh, product. Uh, this tower has been in operation uh, about five years now. And, and it's serving the local, uh, uh, local people, handing over their online ordered parcels. Uh, in front of it, there's a, a, a new product from Cleveron. It's, uh, it's a product in a pilot phase, and it's basically an autonomous uh, a delivery platform or a, or a vehicle that will carry parcels from point A to point B. Uh, and next to these two robotic products, there's a, there's a person just passing by and, and, and doesn't even blink an eye. So robots are very much a thing uh, that, is, uh, uh, that can be seen in Estonia. And you may say that, that Estonians live in a future uh, nicely together with all these, these units that assist them uh, uh, in, their everyday, uh, in their everyday life. Now, Let's jump to the interesting stuff. Let's talk about uh, uh, technology. So, if I, if I think electricity and electric motors, they have been around for, for centuries, or at least it feels like that. There's nothing new about these things. But, um, uh, but it's the computers, the evolution of computers and the internet that has uh, enabled us and many other companies uh, uh, to start building robotic uh, uh, products. And uh, uh, Milram will be talking later on, they'll, they'll build robotic products as well. So, um, uh, what's, uh, what's common on, uh, on this picture is that uh, there, are, there is a combination of, uh, of products because no one product uh, 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 solves the, the kind of a pro uh, the, uh, the order handover uh, um, um, uh, thing for, uh, for most of the users. So we can see here uh, a tiny uh, parcel locker, which is meant for residential uh, 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 clients. Then there are uh, different uh, parcel locker systems. Which, uh, which you can find uh, in many places, in many shapes and forms. Then there are the, uh, the general merchandise uh, uh, lockers on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the picture. And of course, our grocery locker uh, on the uh, left bottom corner of the, uh, of the picture. And again, what ties them together is the fact that they are automating a boring process uh, they are making it quicker, and through that, they save time. And, and as we know, time is money. So uh, that's from where the efficiencies and cost savings are, uh, are coming from. Um, these products in today's world uh, offer great solutions uh, 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 to fight against uh, Corona uh, as well, or COVID-19, because they offer all uh, touch-free handover of, of parcels. People have become to appreciate that more and more. Uh, uh, we've also uh, uh, learned from, from a number of uh, uh, re research documentations that young people these days, uh, uh, regardless of corona, are less and less interested in face-to-face in -face communication. So going and using a, a, a uh, a parcel robot to pick up your, your uh, uh, parcels is their uh, preferred uh, solution. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump on. I'd quickly uh, uh, talk about our, our current products as well that we offer all, uh, all around the world. We have our Cleveron 401, which we already uh, spoke about. That's our, our oldest parcel robot. And, uh, and it offers a very small uh, footprint. Uh, next to it, there's, uh, there's another indoor uh, uh, robotic solution for general merchandise that is uh, uh, a modular product. 
uh, this modular product can accommodate uh, parcels from, uh, from a capacity of 300 to 3,000 units. That's quite a bit. And that's really important for uh, uh, retailers who have a very high flow of, uh, of parcels going through their, um, um, their online store or, or their actual store. Uh, from there on, we have, a, we have a tiny guy, let's put it this way, Cleveron 403. It's a, a smaller uh, version uh, uh, of the 402. Uh, it can fit into tight spaces, but it still gives you this robotic feel, this good user experience, where the customer goes to the unit, just scans their receive uh, code and receives their parcel. All nice and ergonomic. Uh, then we have the Cleveron 501, a grocery robot. There's no other such robot in the world today. It, uh, uh, it has internally uh, two different temperature zones that ensures that all your products are at the right temperature. It's easy to set up and it's easy to uh, get going with this product. And Jumping back uh, to, uh, uh, to locker systems, uh, these were, were the first ones that we introduced to the market. We were a pioneer on that, that front. We still manufacture them. They are still a very popular uh, product. And, and as I said, they come in different uh, shapes and forms. Uh, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, build up big locker banks out of them, or uh, you can use um, a small, uh, plug-and-play units that you can install uh, outside or, or indoors. Very good product for a, a SME who just wants to start their, um, their click-and-collect offer. Cleveron doesn't only sell our, uh, our, or sell or promote our current products. Uh, we continue investing uh, a lot into, into R&D. Uh, and, and we see that this is uh, uh, what brings us uh, uh, forward and that makes us uh, attractive to our clients. Uh, just a couple of years ago, Cleveron ran the first uh, uh, open uh, or the first uh, public drone delivery service that was open to, uh, to, to everybody. Uh, so that has, uh, at that time, uh, that was not done nor by Google or, 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 or other companies who were exploring this technology. These days we are more uh, focusing on uh, uh, self-delivery vehicles and platforms and we are making great, uh, uh, great uh, uh, progress with them. We believe that these delivery units will tie together uh, retailers, postal and logistics companies and, uh, and our uh, robotic terminals and form an ecosystem that can really drive down the cost of, uh, of handling uh, uh, large volumes of, of online orders and handing them over to uh, end users. So, Altogether, such a network will save you again time and, and, uh, and bring the efficiency uh, of the handover uh, out or up. I'll tell you a bit uh, about uh, uh, who and where we are today as well. So, uh, so basically, we are today uh, uh, in 25 different countries. Uh, uh, that's where you can find our technology, and if I say 25 countries, it includes the states of uh, EU, uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, and also the Americas. There's um, a team of 200 very talented uh, uh, guys, in, uh, guys and girls in, in, in Cleveron who, uh, who are really uh, passionate about what they do. They push very hard every day to, to come up with new solutions or support our products that are spread ac across the world. 
uh, we have uh, about 3,800 uh, parcel terminals up and running uh, uh, today. And this includes then uh, um, uh, grocery uh, lockers, uh, uh, general merchandise, uh, robots, and parcel lockers. Uh, if you consider the volume that uh, that goes through our our units, it's about 1.3 uh, uh, million uh, uh, parcels per month. And when we when we talk about the storage space or the storage locks, uh, slots, then we can say that at, that we are able to accommodate the storage of uh, over half a million uh, uh, parcels. So these are really large numbers in, in, in uh, the e-commerce and logistics and, uh, uh, and click and collect world. And I uh, can tell you that these numbers haven't kind of happened over, overnight. Uh, it's, it's taken years to, to achieve this. And uh, for that, I really like to say a big thank you to our team Cleveron. So we'll be pushing, pushing, pushing further and, and coming up with new, uh, new and exciting uh, uh, products. But to conquer the world, hardly uh, ever one can do that alone. We have uh, as well partners. We have uh, uh, distributors and agents in different regions. Uh, our, our partners help us to sell our products, uh, they uh, help us to, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, service our products. They have the uh, 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 specific local uh, knowledge how to operate in these, these markets where we are today. And we have continuously new partners coming, coming on board. And if you feel that you want to join, there's plenty of opportunity to be our agent or, or perhaps even uh, operate as a technical partner. Uh, so finally, um, we see that the retail industry is, uh, is uh, having big challenges. The challenges are caused uh, by, uh, by uh, Corona, plus they are caused by uh, the growth of, of consumption. Everybody wants to buy something new um, to, uh, to manage these volumes is difficult. But luckily, Cleveron has, uh, has solutions. We have uh, our, uh, our products, we have our services that, you, that we can offer, and we can do that all around the world. So thank you, everybody, uh, for the time. I'm really uh, hoping to, uh, to chat to you uh, later on as well and uh, to see what interests you. And uh, let's see where it takes us. Thank you. Mikael, thank you very much. Please take a seat. Good talk. All right. Thanks. Very interesting product. Clever on, very interesting company and the products that you're producing. Quick one, though, before we start, that slide that you had with the technology and you showed the different lockers and in the upper left corner, it was like a, a locker of like a personal letterbox. Exactly. I think that's like down the street from my house. I run past that every day. Let's put it this way that we are uh, running a pilot project in Estonia. Yeah. And, uh, and we are... Uh, and that's where the, the smallness of Estonia comes in. It's a very good testing ground. Mm. So we, we run a pro uh, project with about 150 personal lockers and we want to get the customer feedback, plus we want to engage the local uh, uh, courier companies to deliver into these, uh, uh, these personal uh, lockers. We see there uh, 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 a lot of potential behind this product, but it needs to be tested before uh, we can come out with a, with a real business model that can work in Estonia and in States and in all, all uh, other countries. But yeah, we're working on it. Sure, I mean, it's a very common thing we've heard today in the last three days about Estonia is a great test market. It's a small market. So with that solution, you're looking at basically uh, individual lockers, like kind of like someone's letterbox, but uh, advanced online connected letterbox. Cause I mean, I can see where you're going with that and you need to validate the market because look, every day I'm going for a run, I'm probably a bit crazy in the head, I'm all exhausted. I'm like, wow, how many parcels do you need to get from Amazon before you need a locker out the front of your own house? 
Yeah, but again, <laughs> it's not only about your general merchandise lockers from Amazon. It's all about uh, uh, food delivery. True. We we think that uh, uh, what what these uh, uh, grocers and uh, courier companies need is a bit time, mm. time so that they can plan their uh, their courier rounds in a in a good way uh, and through that save uh, uh, save money. So if they can plan their uh, route, they can stop by your place before you come home and then for you as an end user the parcel will already be waiting you it's it's not you waiting for the parcel but the parcel or the grocer is waiting for you that's the idea behind it all but right let's make more if you can home deliver my steak so it's ready to cook when i get home then okay yes. I'm, I'm thinking about getting on board with this very I can, good i can get there i wanted to talk about the terminology that you had so there's a parcel locker and I click the board and the door opens. Exactly. But then your next solutions, the 401 and I think the 402 and the up there, but you call them robots in your terminology still. Yes. I guess uh, the difference is that, uh, that uh, these robotic products are more advanced and, and these robots do more for you, mm. offer you convenience. Basically, if you go to a, a standard parcel locker and I expect... Most of the people have seen one yeah. and used one. Dunk, the door opens. Uh, yeah, yeah, door opens. Pretty straightforward. Uh, then compared to that, uh, uh, you don't need to run from the console to the door to grab the parcel. The parcel can be high up or, or somewhere mm. at the low level. It'll be ergonomically inconvenient for you. So the robot solves all these problems for you. The robot will, will uh, uh, go somewhere high up Grab, the, grab your parcel, bring it to you, and you receive it from the, from the console. So no running around. Plus, you can go height-wise. You mm. can go width-wise uh, 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 with the robot uh, that you can't do really with, uh, uh, with a parcel locker. Plus, another benefit, it's, it's perhaps less convenient for the end user to grab their parcel but it's very inconvenient for the uh, courier guy who yeah, loads yeah, yeah, the yeah. machine to run around. We, we know that with large, uh, large parcel units, the, the guys will be running miles there, literally. Yeah, I, I went to the locker the other day to post something, and the, you see the guy loading up the thing, and I'm like, I'm like, how long? And he's like, 20 minutes. And I was like, ah, okay, I'm coming back. Yeah. But I do use, one of your 401s is down the street from here in, in Teleskivi, and that's mm -hmm. uh, right next to where my office is, and it's very convenient. And, and I can see it. I mean, it's where you just showed the picture of the 401. It's the tube one that yeah. kind of went up like a cylinder. But it's... Like you look up like that, it's tall. It definitely makes use yeah, of that upward yeah. space. Yeah, the people in US would know that the, the pickup towers in Walmart. That's what it is. Clever on 401. Hmm. So and and that's where we want to get. We want to kind of uh, spread these units out there. Uh, US market is definitely our focus market. Hmm. We've just. Uh, uh, are about to launch Cleveron Incorporated there. The business is already registered. Right. It's just about the COVID and the timing <laughs> that we need to get right. So sure. we are ready. We want to come and we want to do great things over there and, and uh, elsewhere. I wish you the best of luck in America. I think you've got a great product. Thank you very much, Mika. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Okay, in our morning session, talking about IoT and manufacturing and electronics, we have two more Estonian companies to highlight for you this morning. Our next company is Kodusema, and they are an architectural and engineering company that creates sustainably innovative living and housing solutions. And to tell us all about Kodusema, let's welcome up CEO uh, Birgit Linamai. Thank you. So, for any of us listening today and watching today, let's think about housing and space where we work and live in globally. Most of us are very lucky to have the quality space we need, but many of us spend a lot of time commuting. Three million people move to cities every week. We have not enough good quality architecture and housing units available. We also have 
too rigid zoning laws in urban planning. You may be watching from home or, or office, but distinguishing between what is a home and what an office is no longer valid. It's no longer black and white, you know, having sheets in the office. Does that make it a home? And working from home, does that make it an office? Think about it. Most of us have been largely spending the last six months working from home. So the boundaries are shifting and we are being motivated by freedom to choose. Freedom to choose and decide about our lives, about the way we do things, and that's how we're, more, we're happier. So Kodasama is a company founded in 2013. Uh, it is a company that creates movable future-proof houses uh, for global communities and for individual freestanding purpose. The Freedom Reference takes us to Kodasema founder Hannah Stamierv, who says that we automatically consume less when living smaller. We automatically leave a smaller footprint when our house is small and we have less things. That may make us happy as well. So, Kodasema, as an engineering and architecture firm, founded in 2013, seven years ago, creates sustainable spaces for the future. Temporary housing is something that societies need to get used to. Often, this is considered as something underclass and unfavorable. Think of caravans. This needs to change too. We like cities that grow with us. We like cities that change together with the purpose of our lives. We like to turn brownfield areas that used to be industrial into service economy spaces where, where services are offered by communities and by people for the people. Our children grow, start going to schools and activity clubs our needs change, and this involves a lot of commuting. Data shows that creating urban communities where we live closely and safely together with a full range of services available, knowing our neighbors, feel, feeling safer, makes us happier because we experience less stress. The, the stress is caused by uncomfortable spaces and by excessive commuting. We at Kodosema and in Estonia have a tool for a global housing solution. We want to work together with you globally to deliver contemporary spaces in the Americas and, and elsewhere. Koda is a perfect tool to legalize smaller spaces, larger spaces, clusters, hubs and entire parts of cities. In the future, we imagine that cities will consist of, of very smartly built hubs that are extremely well connected. Studies um, also show that being surrounded by wood as a material makes us feel good, so we have less stress and can perform, perform best um, in the things we like. Especially in the times of COVID-19, everyone needs to have more good news. There is also data that shows that the construction industry has not modernized enough over the last 60 years as compared to agriculture and other producing industries. Estonia as a country and Koda as a house have a similarity. They both appear much larger than they actually are. Estonia with its 1.3 million people, Koda with the smallest unit, about 26 square meters. It is an impact that we are creating together, both um, globally. So Estonia is 37% the size of New York, with a population of only 7% of New York. In other figures, there are 159 people per square kilometer in New York, whereas if all Estonian people went to New York, there would still be only 10 persons per square kilometer. 
Now, interesting enough that at the same time, the tiny but impactful Estonia is the largest timber frame house exporter in Europe and number four in the world, as data shows. So the award-winning Coda House is a perfect example of Estonian high-quality architecture, high-quality education in architecture, design, engineering, economics, woodworking, and ICT. Estonia is also a small country where people are skillful in foreign languages. You often meet people who speak five to six languages, and in brackets, I happen to speak 11. This enables managing foreign direct investments very well and creating enterprise value for companies that decide to invest here. What is the future of Estonian housing construction? When looking for a smaller environmental footprint and less hassle for your next home, look for timber frame and prefab. We at Kodasim are very, very proud to be pitching here um, in the US and representing the high quality of our country. US has excellent market demand and production engineering capabilities. Initiatives like regenerative cities, future cities, placemaking, these go very well with our philosophy here at, uh, at Kodasema and the brand concept globally. We believe that uh, places created by communities for the people are the strongest. The power of, of a community is very, very strong and not to be underestimated. We're going to look at a video now In this video, you see the design patented Koda by Koda Sema microhouses. They have been awarded numerous prizes worldwide, mainly for its simple architecture that has been stripped from everything excessive. The houses show an extremely efficient use of space. So Koda Sema creates Nordic movable Koda houses whole communities, clusters, parks, and hubs. They can be placed everywhere, urban, context, and rural. Our minimum viable space is similar to what, a, what an MVP is in, in engineering. It is, it is really a minimum viable space where you do not have anything um, unnecessary. It doesn't have any ornaments, it doesn't have any patterns, so it doesn't interfere with, uh, with whoever is doing whatever. This is why it is a minimum viable space. It's a free form, it's a free form of space and walls. Today, nowadays, what is called high-tech design, as you can see, the Kodas being driven through the streets of Tallinn, relocating overnight. This high-tech design can be one day a site for working, the next day it can be um, an office, a hairdresser salon, a hospital, a school, exactly according to the human needs. So what we did here in Tallinn, Estonia, and as we have in the pipeline in many other global countries, um, is, is a movable city, a cluster. The entire cluster of Koda moved uh, within two nights we replaced and translocated 20 houses uh, and set up a, a cluster of, of homes, hotels. For example, in Holland alone, there are currently 300,000 housing units needed. And the figures are similar elsewhere in Europe. We'll switch to the next slide. So as, as we see over one million people urbanizing, there is a lot of housing units required everywhere. The two concepts, individual freestanding kodas and entire koda park communities, they enable the cities to grow dynamically and to change very quickly as more children are born or less, exactly as their requirement goes. And this leaves at the same time a very small environmental footprint. The houses are movable, they are shipped volumetrically, turn key, plug and play, move in, take, pick your toothbrush and move in. So, Kodasima target audience in, in two 
key categories in the US and globally is buyers and customers, at the same time, enablers and partners. We want to talk to property owners, landowners, developers, housing companies, uh, all, all sorts of organizations who deal with property. And we also want to talk to ambassadors and facilitators of all sorts to, uh, to enable the change in housing to happen more quickly. So the Coda Sema corporate overview in figures. Coda is placed now in nine countries. We have just recently started our over, organ, operations in the US, having, having launched a company, and we will be announcing that shortly. Um, there are over 30 agents and distributors everywhere globally. There are different production technologies that go into the Coda shell. But what is one and unique is that they look, feel, touch, and uh, impression of the Coda is always the same. So you can have the Coda made in different technologies, in different parts of the world, in different countries, in different factories, with, using different materials like uh, concrete, like timber frame. Um, you can use uh, SIP panels, uh, MTO, uh, steel frame. You can do high rise or low rise. But the look and feel is always our design patented Coda award winning architecture that, uh, that we've been praised, praised a lot for. So, global distribution now is taking place in Europe in more than 15 countries and we have just uh, made our first initial steps to the US. We're planning to establish uh, licensing collaborations in, in North America, in South America. Um, the USA is, is a very important site for us in terms of production. We, f we find there is a lot of competence uh, in the US for uh, engineering skills and also a lot of comprehensions in terms of design. The Nordic design, which is the Coda handwriting, is, is very well understood in the US and very well appreciated. We treasure our dear partners in, in New York and Florida, Brian and Stanley, um, who pay, play the key role in uh, venturing uh, the US and currently seeing the pipeline for several uh, Coda-based property development projects um, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and in the central part of the country is a very, very exciting time for us. So the Coda has three concepts. There is a freestanding Coda, which can be placed in the backyard as a granny home, as an ADU unit, as an accessory, uh, accessory dwelling unit. The regulations globally vary. Um, but we aim at creating more impact through making uh, Coda Park clusters of, of development. Uh, we want to uh, provide more housing units for the shortage to, to solve actually the global and in the US very much sensed housing, housing requirement. There is way too much low quality architecture and low quality uh, construction available globally and we need to change that. So Coda has been winning no numerous awards. Um, it is really an important thing to have these awards because it adds a lot of credibility to a company uh, which comes from a, from a tiny little country that creates a, a big impact. Quite recently, Coda was uh, announced as the best small construction um, of the country. So uh, on this photograph, the president uh, of Estonia, Kersti Kaljolaid, is handing over the prize to uh, Coda Sema board members, uh, um, Mr. Tamirv and myself. There is a diversity of models the quotas can be placed uh, in different settings, urban or rural. They can be made to float, to extend the territory use at the Fort waterfront. Another very important aspect to us is sustainability. The house is small. Uh, there are a couple of versions, but the house is still small. But at the same time, it feels much bigger when you go inside, mainly because the ceiling is so high. Our head architect, Ulla Mark, says that it's much more 
difficult to be designing a house that is uh, small. It's much easier to do um, a larger house, and it's also much easier to be writing a long story rather than short. So the original Koda concrete, Koda was made out of concrete, and, and now we have a Koda which is made uh, on uh, different carcasses, but the main material is timber, and Estonia is very resourceful in timber, so uh, we want to bring that to much broader audiences in the world. Koda is very close to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, number 11 and 12, to create more sustainable cities and uh, to do it in an efficiently produce, producing way. We want to reduce waste globally on on-site production, which is why off-site production is becoming uh, a, a growing tendency globally. We also uh, changed our Coda model a little bit specifically for the US uh, to enable cultural uh, aspects uh, of uh, preferring a washer and dryer, which is not the tra tradition in Europe. So this is a, an example how a small company needs to be dynamic and how the space needs to be dynamic and serve the human needs. I'm scrolling through the Coda models to show you the different optionality uh, and to show you the, the talent of Estonian architects and engineers of putting these things all together. The codas can be combined and stacked in different ways, uh, creating communities wherever and whenever. In Tallinn, a temporary building license is given for seven years. In many other countries, for five years. In many other countries, this period of years is longer. And, um, and we believe this is going to be a future housing tendency as well, that not everything is erected permanently, that the housing is permanent, but the locations vary. So we are passionate to give uh, tools for the housing crisis. We're also passionate to give increasingly affordable dynamic spaces globally. A Kodak automatically gives more space, energy and time, leaving a smaller footprint and enabling us to be happier. Being able to take your house with you or erect it wherever you like is freedom. Koda and Estonia give the tool globally to create the communities that their mankind needs. Thank you. Very nice video. Why don't you sit down and take a seat. Thank you. Hi. Good talk. Good one. Thank you. Please take a seat here. I've seen your houses around Tallinn. I've seen them and I saw them in different places. I was like, how do they, they were there and then they were there. How do they get? Okay, now I've learned how these things work. So have you been to one? No, I haven't been in one, no. So I'm inviting you, you can go tomorrow. Okay, great, I can check it out. They seem very nice and they seem, okay, then you fit them out with nice things. And I saw the one down the harbor and then I know you had the other one over near the Sarmatorg. Uh, as well, they got moved over there. Yeah, yeah there is, there's a bunch of codas everywhere, here and there, and quite recently, I mean, over the last 12, 12 months, there has been quite an acceleration, so it's no wonder that you see them here and there, and if, if you're tired after these four days of talking here, I'm sure you can take a good relaxing moment over on the Tallinn waterfront uh, in the Koda Stay Hotel. You know, we run a hotel, did you know that? Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we, all, we also have a Koda Hotel in Ireland. You can also, uh, well, not, not right well, now, we but... Get to Ireland, yeah, when you get but... to Ireland, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you, you pointed out a lot of different uses for it. You showed all kinds of different use cases. You could stack them and you could put the short ones and the long ones together and different uses. You're sort of not just about, okay, here's a thing. You're saying here's how they can be combined into the park or this use or that use. What would you say, like, what's sort of the most interesting or the most interesting use or innovative or different or that you didn't expect use of it? We've just, I've been uh, quite shocked that the, these, uh, the multitude of uses can actually come together so quickly. So when we erected the Skoda Park here in Tallinn and after relocating it really literally in two, two nights and mm. you know, the houses are so big so you can actually transport them only overnight. And these convoys of housing going through the city and then a couple, couple of weeks later we, we realized there was a flower shop and there were, there were different restaurants and a cafe and, and uh, we did have an art gallery and maybe that was one of the most shocking uh, things. And, and this is quite 
quite fashionable to reduce everything now globally. And I know they had this one painting show in, in New York uh, for a Japanese artist. And so we decided to, to kind of take that uh, minimizing and, and, and growing forward with a more minimalistic approach, you know, less is more. So we did invite an Estonian famous painter, Andres Kord, to have his paintings in there. He literally had two paintings and, and we had a whole event in uh, combination with an architectural tour in the old town uh, by a historian and that was that was fabulous and okay. it was two paintings and we all sat around and went oh yes hmm, very very good yeah very but nowadays people just need as i said so many times before people people we have so many bad news and you know I, I read the other day that you actually need to have five good news to one bad news so with this constant flow of covid being on the front page of all the newspapers this is just this is just not what people need so uh, having a, a space for contemplation really if it's with one painting or two mm -hmm. paintings or with a bit of music or you can make koda into a cinema or or, or you can turn it into a retirement home or you, you can do all sorts of things. And this is what I meant to say when you say that this is a, this a high, uh, high tech design. It doesn't interfere with anything, of course. If you do make a hospital out of it, then you probably need different regulations for that. But other than that, there's, there's a multitude of things that you can do because the same space doesn't interfere. I like that retirement home. Mum and dad, I'm going to ship one to Australia. In you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> You talk, I, I, it's very interesting to see how you're moving into the U.S. market. And I like that you put some of the uh, indicative prices up there for the different units that you have. I wasn't sure whether I was allowed to ask that question or not. Uh, so I'm glad that you put that in a slide <laughs> and we learned sort of what's the ballpark of what one of these uh, units might be worth. Now, you've talked a lot about the products uh, you're using, the Estonian wood, the Estonian materials, obviously the Estonian design. At, when you are getting these into the States... Uh, is it better for you to build them here and ship them or do you send the materials over and build them there? How's that going for you? This is an exciting time and this is a very valid question and we're, we're really exploring all different opportunities now and uh, uh, first of all, we thought we were going to produce here and ship them over, and then we ran into a regulatory difficulty. It's still the U.S. is very protectionist, and it was quite difficult. So we have uh, sorted out production partners now. We're licensing the production out to uh, three different producers in, in North America, two of them are in the U.S., and uh, there's another component supplier from, from outside. Uh, but at the same time, we are also contemplating on producing them here in very high quantities because we need these different uh, material solutions, different structures, and that's all new to us. Uh, but we realize there's a lot of competence in the U.S., so we can produce there. But uh, but in order to really have the design close to us, it would also be very interesting to collaborate with a large factory here who we are uh, in talks with, and, and they have the capability of sh shipping. You know, imagine you hire a ship and you load 200 units in it and you ship them off to Texas. And the delivery cost is actually half the price of the delivery to Germany as compared to Germany. Huh. Why is huh. it because you've got to go by boat all the way from Thailand? No, because you stack three units in, in the ship. Right. You hire the ship. Yep. And that's how sea transport is simply that much more feasible than mm -hmm. road transport so in Europe. So if you go Europe. to Germany, is it all road the whole way to Germany? It to isn't. Europe? I mean, they still ship it uh, with a ship up to Lübeck or somewhere and, mm. and then truck it down. But nevertheless, hmm. putting three, stacking three on a ship just to uh, give such a big economy of scale that right, it makes sense. Right, okay, that makes sense. So we you're taking the whole ship. You're not just, yeah, you're going, right, we'll, we'll take everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not, you don't grow to be so big overnight. I mean, mm. um, who are the, these people who get a first order which grows from, from one to 250? I mean, if you're talking about houses, I mean, you're not talking about some sort of gadget or anything. 250 mm. houses is still quite a bit of... Quite sure. a bit of space. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and if you ship them on a boat to America, at least the crew have somewhere to sleep. Am I right? Anyone? Okay, good. <laughs> We're going to end here. Thank you very much, Birgit. Thank you so much. It's time. enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good. Thanks, guys. Uh, we are coming to the final talk of our morning session here. We've been talking about IoT, manufacturing, and electronics industry in Estonia. And we've been trying to give you a broad overview of the different sorts of very innovative companies that are working in this space. Now, if you want to connect with these companies, you can do so inside of the Imprompt Me webpage that you're looking at right now. You can connect with the companies. We have representatives from all of these companies on board, also from Invest Estonia, Trade Estonia. You can have one-on-one -on -one videos. Uh, if they can't get to your question right now, they will absolutely get to it in the next couple of days. So please do engage. Please do ask your questions because this is your chance to get your questions answered. Now, 
We have one more talk today uh, in our topic on IoT and manufacturing, and this company is called Millerem. Now, Millerem Robotics are the leading developer of robotics and autonomous systems in Europe. They're making products that they're making robots and devices that are helping people in dangerous and dirty zones. They're going in where people can't go in. Maybe it's too dangerous. Maybe it's too dirty. Maybe it's too difficult with safety means. This is what it's about. They're also a defense contractor and their defense oriented products are already being used in 10 different countries and some of those countries are NATO countries. So this is legit. There's a lot going on here with Millerem. So to tell us all about it, let's have the CEO, Mr. Kulda Barasi. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kulda Barasi and I'm the CEO and founder of Millerem Robotics. And first of all, I would like to thank Enterprise Estonia for organizing such an excellent event and uh, I'm very grateful and honored for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, to give you a heads up about the presentation, I have to warn you that this has heavy metal, AI, and collaborative robots in it. But I can promise you this is not the Terminator scenario. So, setting the context, uh, Miller and Robotics is the leading robotics developer and manufacturer in uh, Europe. And uh, what, we, what we are, we are an Estonian company who utilizes Scandinavian technologies and uses that on the home market mainly in the Europe. And we have our headquarters in Estonia, in Tallinn, but we have as well engineering offices both in uh, Finland and Sweden. In Sweden, it's very nice northern town called Önskersvik. And we are just about to make the decision to open up the sales and demo center also in Netherlands. So we really feel uh, comfortable and at home in Europe. Uh, as told, we have sold uh, mainly today the defense sector robotic solutions in many different countries. Ten, of them, ten, ten different countries, seven of them are NATO countries. As a company, we have grown quite rapidly. Uh, growing 600% revenue uh, two years ago and 100% revenue this year, reaching 10.5 million euros. And we can foresee that doubling that uh, figure over the next years is not a problem. And why is that? Because the robotics market is really rapidly growing. And uh, our real value obviously, obviously lies in our people. We have excellent engineers, both in Estonia, in Sweden, and in, uh, in Finland, and uh, altogether more than 120 people working there. But uh, how do we do this innovation? Uh, what we realized in the beginning that the concept of the vehicle, or rather the mobility platform, will change significantly if you remo remove humans from it. And that is the reason why we started uh, the development from the robotic platform or the mobility platform. Today we have two different size categories of the platforms. We have uh, TEMIS and Multiscope. TEMIS in the uh, military or defense side and Multiscope on different uh, applications for the civilian uh, use. And what is the beauty of these platforms is that they are really versatile, open mobility platforms. So you can equip whatever your imagination allows onto these. And now we have just introduced the much, much bigger system, mainly for the military use case, which is called Type-X. That's first purpose-built robotic platform in uh, that size category in the NATO countries. Okay, platforms, it's nice. Vehicles have built already tens and almost hundreds of years, but uh, what next? Uh, what we want to do is to remove human uh, from that loop, to leave human just controlling and giving the, uh, uh, giving the tasks and giving the commands. So that means that our vehicles need to be somewhat intelligent. 
So adding the intelligent functions to these vehicles has been the second step in order to uh, make really that technology work. And the third step, which is very important, is the collaborative uh, collaborative uh, application or collaborative behavior because we don't want to have one operator or one uh, uh, human controlling only one system but we want to have the uh, swarm of systems acting together and working on the on the uh, single task so let me show you one video which gives you brief understanding on the firefighting side what that collaborative work needs. So here you can see the uh, potential scenario in the uh, plant where some accident happens and uh, there is a fire. So using the robotic systems which are semi-autonomous that means that in some applications and in some tasks the human operator operates them but uh, they have as well enough intelligence to cover some of the tasks on their own. We have firefighting systems or fire extinguishing systems. We have surveillance system with drone on it. So we can allocate the uh, problematic area. We can drive in the vehicles into that area and we can start the auto automated uh, fire control or fire ex extinguishing uh, mission. And obviously I think that it doesn't need any explanation why that is better than having human firefighters there. First of all, it's more efficient and most importantly, it's much, much safer for the humans. And as well, the areas where you can't even send the human operators or human firefighters in, the gas leaks, the peak plants, the peak uh, underground uh, parking lots, you can just imagine that there are many, many occasions where uh, these kind of robotic solutions are, are much more efficient. Or what has been a big problem, problem over the last uh, years are the forest fires. The same application, same systems are good for that. So you can easily, based on that uh, video, you can imagine uh, different payloads integrated on the same mobility platform and used in the collaborative manner. Even more complex solution is related to the forestry. And there is a big demand for the uh, labor in the forest regeneration today. Basically 99% of the uh, forest regeneration today is conducted by human labor, just planting the seedlings, which makes it very inefficient and also the rate of the forest regeneration is not, uh, not what we might need. So once again, we have very a uh, very uh, modular platform where we can integrate uh, the uh, forest harvester and we can integrate that as well where the planting device and combine them into the one central network and use one operator to control 10 plus different robotic systems in the mission area where they already operate in the autonomous uh, manner doing what they have been told. What, what adds to that the value is that by doing that, we have very precise digital twin of this planting site. And we can monitor it uh, very precisely and make the decisions when, when we need the intervention, when we need to uh, maybe clean between the uh, tree rows, or may maybe when we need to do something elsewhere. Uh, all these applications, what you have seen, are based on our uh, product, which for the civilian uh, side is Multiscope and for the uh, defense side is uh, Timis. Uh, the development of that, as mentioned, started from the scratch, from the idea that we don't never have human uh, operator inside or on the vehicle, and this is just for the uh, just for the payloads, and it needs to be very maneuverable and it needs to be very versatile in terms of the payload applications and the integration. Here you can see uh, the vehicle in different exercises and in different tests. So literally any terrain, any location, any climate zone from uh, Estonian cold to African Mali uh, desert heat. We have tested it, we have tried it and we know it works. 
Actually, one of our users as well is uh, U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, who has the assessment units at their hands. So here you can see uh, the uh, desert applications in uh, Estonian uh, French uh, mission.